All right, welcome back to another episode of Mike Reads. Today, we'll be continuing our series on the Complete Federalist Papers with Federalists numbers 64 and 65, which are the same subject continued, and that subject is the powers of the Senate. Before we start, it is, for some reason, sweltering in my office again. I thought I had the air conditioning problem resolved. I guess I didn't. Um, So the window is open, which means that if you hear the birds chirping or one of my neighbors mowing their lawns in the background, My apologies in advance. I don't know what to do about that just yet. Uh, Hopefully we'll have this resolved in short order. So without further ado, let's dive into Federalist Number 64, The Powers of the Senate, which was written from the Independent Journal, Wednesday, March 5th, 1788, by John Jay, and addressed to the people of the state of New York. It is a just and not a new observation that enemies to particular persons and opponents to particular measures seldom confine their censures to such things only and either as are worthy of blame. Unless on this principle it is difficult to explain the motives of their conduct, who condemn the proposed constitution in the aggregate, and treat with severity some of the most unexceptionable articles in it. The second section gives power to the president, quote, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. The power of making treaties is an important one, especially as it relates to war, peace, and commerce, and it should not be delegated but in such a mode, and with such precautions, as will afford the highest security that it will be exercised by men the best qualified for the purpose, and in the manner most conducive to the public good. The Convention appears to have been attentive to both these points. They have directed the president to be chosen by select bodies of electors, to be deputed by the people for that express purpose, and they have committed the appointment of senators to the state legislatures. This mode has, in such cases, vastly the advantage of elections by the people in their collective capacity, where the activity of party zeal, taking the advantage of the supineness, the ignorance, and the hopes and fears of the unwary and interested, often places men in office by the votes of a small proportion of the electors. As the select assemblies for choosing the president, as well as the state legislatures who appoint the senators, will in general be composed of the most enlightened and respectable citizens, there is reason to presume that their attention and their votes will be directed to those men only who have become the most distinguished by their abilities and virtue, and in whom the people perceive just grounds for confidence. The Constitution manifests very particular attention to this object. By excluding men under 35 from the first office and those under 30 from the second, it confines the electors to men of whom the people have had time to form a judgment and with respect to whom they will not be liable to be deceived by those brilliant appearances of genius and patriotism which, like transient meteors, sometimes mislead as well as dazzle. If the observation be well-founded that wise kings will always be served by able ministers, it is fair to argue that as an assembly of select electors possess, in a greater degree than kings, the means of extensive and accurate information relative to men and characters, so will their appointments bear at least equal marks of discretion and discernment. The inference which naturally results from these considerations is this that the president and senators so chosen will always be of the number of those who best understand our national interests, whether considered in relation to the several states or to foreign nations, who are best able to promote those interests, and whose reputation for integrity inspires and merits confidence. With such men, the power of making treaties may be safely lodged. Although the absolute necessity of system in the conduct of any business is universally known and acknowledged, yet the high importance of it in national affairs has not yet become sufficiently impressed on the public mind. They who wish to commit the power under consideration to a popular assembly, composed of members constantly coming and going in quick succession, seem not to recollect that such a body must necessarily be inadequate to the attainment of those great objects, which require to be steadily contemplated in all their relations and circumstances, and which can only be approached and achieved by measures which not only talents, but also exact information and often much time, are necessary to concert and to execute. It was wise, therefore, in the Convention to provide not only the power of making treaties should be committed to able and honest men, 
but also that they should continue in place a sufficient time to become perfectly acquainted with our national concerns and to form and introduce a system for the management of them. The duration prescribed is such as will give give them an opportunity of greatly extending their political information and of rendering their accumulating experience more and more beneficial to their country. Nor has the convention discovered less prudence in providing for the frequent elections of senators in such a way as to obviate the inconvenience of periodically transferring those great affairs entirely to new men. For by leaving considerable residue of the old ones in place, uniformity and order, as well as a constant succession of official information will be preserved. There are a few who will not admit that the affairs of trade and navigation should be regulated by a system cautiously formed and steadily pursued, and that both our treaties and our laws should correspond with and be made to promote it. It is of much consequence that this correspondence and conformity can be carefully maintained, And they who assent to the truth of this position will see and confess that it is well provided for by making concurrence of the Senate necessarily both to treaties and to laws. It seldom happens in the negotiation of treaties, of whatever nature, but that perfect secrecy and immediate despatch are sometimes requisite. These are cases where the most useful intelligence may be obtained if the persons possessing it can be relieved from apprehensions of discovery. Those apprehensions will operate on those persons whether they are actuated by mercenary or friendly motives, and there doubtless are many of both descriptions who would rely on the secrecy of the president, but who would not confide in that of the Senate, and still less in that of a large popular assembly. The the convention have done well, therefore, in so disposing of the power of making treaties that although the president must, in forming them, act by the advice and consent of the Senate, yet he will be able to manage the business of intelligence in such a manner as prudence may suggest. They who have turned their attention to the affairs of men must have perceived that there are tides in them, tides very irregular in their duration, strength, and direction, and seldom found to run twice exactly in the same manner or measure. To discern and to profit by these tides in national affairs is the business of those who preside over them. And they who have had much experience in this head inform us that there frequently are occasions when days, nay, even when hours are precious. The loss of a battle, the death of a prince, the removal of a minister, or other circumstances intervening to change the present posture and aspect of affairs may turn the most favorable tide into a course opposite to our wishes. As in the field, so in the cabinet, there are moments to be seized as they pass, and they who preside in either should be left in capacity to improve them. So often and so essentially have we heretofore suffered from the want of secrecy and despatch, that the Constitution would have been inexcusably defective if no attention had been paid to these objects. Those matters which in Those matters, which in negotiations usually requires the most secrecy and most dispatch, are those preparatory and auxiliary measures which are not otherwise important to a national view than as they tend to facilitate the attainment of the objects of the negotiation. For these, the President will find no difficulty to provide, and should any circumstance occur which requires the advice and consent of the Senate, he may at any time convene them. Thus we see that the Constitution provides that our negotiations for treaties shall have every advantage which can be derived from talents, information, integrity, and deliberate investigations on the one hand, and from secrecy and dispatch on the other. But to this plan, as to most others have, that have been ever appeared, objections are contrived and urged. Some are displeased with it, not on account of any errors or defects in it, but because, as the treaties when made, are to have the force of laws, they should be made only by men invested with legislative authority. These gentlemen seem not to consider that the judgments of our courts and the commissions constitutionally given by our governor are as valid and as binding on all persons whom they concern as the laws passed by our legislature. All constitutional acts of power, whether in the executive or in the judicial department, have as much legal validity and obligation as if they proceeded from the legislature, and therefore, whatever name be given to the power of making treaties, or however obligatory they may may be when made, 
certain it is that the people may, with much propriety, commit the power to a distinct body from the legislature, the executive, or the judicial. It surely does not follow that because they have given the power of making laws to the legislature, that therefore they should likewise give them the power to do every other act of sovereignty by which the citizens are to be bound and affected. <clears throat> Others, though content that treaties should be made in the mode proposed, are averse to their being the supreme laws of the land. They insist and profess to believe that treaties like acts of assembly should be repealable at pleasure. This idea seems to be new and peculiar to this country, but new errors as well as new truths often appear. These gentlemen would do well to reflect that a treaty is only another name for a bargain, and that it would be impossible to find a nation who would make any bargain with us which should should be binding on them absolutely, but on us only so long and so far as we may think proper to be bound by it. They who make laws may, without doubt, amend or repeal them, and it will not be disputed that they who make treaties and may alter or cancel them, but still let us not forget that treaties are made, not by only one of the contracting parties, but by both, and consequently, that as the consent of both was essential to their formation at first, so must it ever afterwards be to alter or cancel them. The proposed Constitution, therefore, has not in the, latest ex has not in the least extended the obligation of treaties. They are just as binding and just as far beyond the lawful reach of legislative acts now as they will be at any future period or under any form of government. However useful jealousy may be in republics, yet when like bile in the natural... It abounds too much in the body politic. The eyes of both both become very liable to be deceived by the delusive appearances which that malady casts on surrounding objects. From this cause, probably, proceed the fears and apprehensions of some that the President and Senate may make treaties without an equal eye to the interests of all the states. Others suspect that two-thirds will oppress the remaining third and ask whether those gentlemen are made sufficiently responsible for their conduct, whether, if they act corruptly, they can be punished, and if they make disadvantageous treaties, how are we to get rid of those treaties? As all the states are equally represented in the Senate, and by men the most able and the most willing to promote the interests of their con constituents, they will all have an equal degree of influence on that body, especially while they continue to be careful in appointing proper persons and to insist in their punctual attendance. In proportion as the United States assume a national form and a national character, so will the good of the whole be more and more an object of attention, and the government must be a weak one indeed if it should forget that the good of the whole can only be promoted by advancing the good of each of the parts or members which compose the whole. It will not be in the power of the President and its Senate to make any treaties by which they and their families and estates will not be equally bound and affected with the rest of the community, and, having no private interest distinct from that of the nation, they will be under no temptations to neglect the latter. As to corruption, the case is not supposable. He must either have been very unfortunate in his intercourse with the world, or possess a heart very susceptible of such impressions, who can think it probable that the President and two-thirds of the Senate will ever be capable of such unworthy conduct. The idea is too gross and too invidious to be entertained. But in such a case, if it should ever happen, the treaties so obtained from us would, like all their fraudulent contracts, be null and void by the law of nations. With respect to the responsibility, it is difficult to conceive how it could be increased. Every consideration that can influence the human mind, such as honor, oaths, reputations, conscience, the love of country, and family affections and attachments, affords security for their fidelity. In short, as the Constitution has taken the utmost care that they shall be men of talents and integrity, we have reason to be persuaded that the treaties they make will be as advantageous as, all circumstances considered, could be made. And so far as the fear of punishment and disgrace can operate, that motive to good behavior is amply afforded by the article on the subject of impeachments. Signed, Publius. All right. Continuing on with Federalist Number 65, The Power of the Senate Continued, which was written from the New York Packet Friday, March 7th, 1788, by Alexander Hamilton, and addressed to the people of the state of New York. <clears throat> 
the remaining powers which the plan of the convention allots to the Senate, in a distinct capacity, are comprised in their participation with the executive in the appointment to offices and in their judicial character as a court for the trial of impeachments. As in the business of appointments, the executive will be the principal agent, the provisions relating to it will most properly be discussed in the examination of that department. We will, therefore, conclude this head with a view of the judicial character of the Senate. A well-constituted court for the trial of impeachments is an object not more to be desired than difficult to be obtained in a government wholly elective. The subject of its jurisdiction are those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men, or, in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. They are of a nature which may with peculiar propriety be, de 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 be denominated political, as they relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to the society itself. The prosecution of them, for this reason, will seldom fail to agitate the passions of the whole community and to divide it into parties more or less friendly or inimical, inimical to, that, to the accused. In many cases, it will connect itself with the pre-existing factions, and it will enlist all their animosities, partialities, influence, and interest on one side or on the other, and in such cases there will always be the greatest danger that the decision will be regulated more by the comparative strength of parties than by the real demonstrations of innocence or guilt. The delicacy and magnitude of a trust so deeply concerns the political reputation and existence of every man engaged in the administration of public affairs speak for themselves. The difficulty of placing it rightly in a government resting entirely on the basis of periodical elections will as readily be perceived when it is considered that the most conspicuous characters in it will, from that circumstance, be too often the leaders or the tools of the most cunning or the most numerous faction, and on those account, and on this account, can hardly be expected to possess the requisite neutrality towards those whose conduct may be the subject of scrutiny. The convention, it appears, thought the Senate the most fit depository of the, this important trust. Those who can best discern the intrinsic difficulty of the thing will be least hasty in condemning that opinion, and will be most inclined to allow due weight to the arguments which may be supposed to have produced it. What, it may be asked, is the true spirit of the institution itself? Is it not designed as a method of national inquest into the conduct of public men? If this be the design of it, who can so properly be the inquisitors for the nation as the representatives of the nation themselves? It is not disputed that the power of originating the inquiry, or, in other words, a preferring the impeachment, ought to be lodged in the hands of one branch of the legislative body. Will not the reasons which indicate the propriety of this arrangement strongly plead for an admission of the other branch of that body to, share, to a share of the inquiry? The model from which the idea of this institution has been borrowed pointed out that course to the convention. In Great Britain, it is the province of the House of Commons to prefer the impeachment and the House of Lords to decide upon it. Several of the state constitutions have followed the example. As well, the latter, as the former, seem to have regarded the practice of impeachments as a bridle in the hands of the legislative body upon the executive servants of the government. Is not this the true light in which it ought to be regarded? Where else than in the Senate could have been found a tribunal sufficiently dignified or sufficiently independent? What other body would be likely to feel confidence, in, in, confidence enough in its own situation to preserve unawed and uninfluenced the necessary impartiality between an individual accused and the representatives of the people, his accusers? Could the Supreme Court have been relied upon as answering this description? It is much to be doubted whether the members of that tribunal would at all times be endowed with so eminent a portion of fortitude as would be called for in the execution of so difficult a task, and it is still more to be doubted whether they would possess the degree of credit and authority which might, on certain occasions, be indispensable towards reconciling the people to a decision that should happen to clash with an accusation brought by their immediate representatives. A deficiency in the first would be fatal 
to the accused in the last dangerous to the public tranquility. The hazard in both these respects could only be avoided, if at all, by rendering the tribunal more numerous than would consist with a reasonable attention to economy. The necessity of a numerous court for the trial of impeachments is equally dictated by the nature of the proceeding. This can never be tied down by such strict rules, either in the delineation of the offense by the press prosecutors, or in the construction of it by the judges, as in common cases serve to limit the discretion of courts in favor of personal security. There will be no jury to stand between the judges who are to pronounce the sentence of the law and the party who is to receive or suffer from it. The awful discretion which a court of impeachment must necessarily have to doom to honor or to infamy the most confidential and the most distinguished characters of the community forbids the commitment of the trust to a small number of persons. The, these considerations seem alone sufficient to authorize a conclusion that the Supreme Court would have been an improper substitute for the Senate as a court of impeachments. There remains a further consideration which will not a little strengthen this conclusion. It is this. The punishment which may be the consequence of conviction upon impeachment is not to terminate the chastisement of the offender. After having been sentenced to a perpetual ostracism from the esteem and confidence and honors and emoluments of his country, he will still be liable to prosecution and punishment in the ordinary course of law. Would it be proper that the persons who had disposed of his fame and his most valuable rights as a citizen in one trial should in another trial, for this same offense, be also the disposers of his life and his fortune? Would, not, would there not be the greatest reason to apprehend that error in the first sentence would be the parent of error in the second sentence? That the strong bias of one decision would be apt to overrule the influence of any new lights which might be brought to vary the complexion of another decision. Those who know anything of human nature will not hesitate to answer these questions in the affirmative, and it will be no loss to perceive that by making the same persons judges in both cases, those who might happen to be the objects of prosecution would, in a great measure, be deprived of the double security intended them by a double trial. The loss of life and estate would often be virtually included in a sentence which, in its terms, imported nothing more than dismission from a present and disqualification for a future office. It may be said that the intervention of a jury in the second, inst in the second instance would obviate the danger, but juries are frequently influenced by the opinions of judges. They are sometimes induced to find special verdicts, which refer the main question to the decision of the court. Who would be willing to stake his life and his estate upon the verdict of a jury acting under the auspices of judges who had predetermined his guilt? Would it have been an improvement of the plan to have united the Supreme Court with the Senate in the formation of the Court of Impeachments? This union would certainly have been attended with several advantages, but they, would, but they have not been overbalanced by the single disadvantage, already stated, arising from the agency of the same judges and the double prosecution to which the offender would be liable. To a certain extent, the benefits of that union would, will, obtain, will be obtained from making the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court the President of the Court of Impeachments, as is proposed to be done in the plan of the Convention. While the inconveniences of an entire incorporation of the former into the latter will be substantially avoided. This was perhaps the prudent mean. I forbear to remark upon the additional pretext for clamor against the judiciary, which so considerable an augmentation of its authority would have afforded. Would it have been desirable to have composed the court for the trial of impeachments of persons wholly distinct from other departments of the government? They are weighty ar there are weighty arguments as well there are weighty arguments as well against as in favor of such a plan. To some minds it will not appear a trivial objection that it could tend to increase the complexity of the political machine and to add a new spring to the government, the utility of which would at best be questionable. But an objection which will not be thought by any unworthy of attention is this. A court formed upon such a plan would either be attended with a heavy expense or might in practice be subject to a variety of casualties and inconveniences. It must either consist of permanent officers, 
stationary at the seat of government, and of course entitled to fixed and regular stipends, or of certain officers of the state governments to be called upon whenever an impeachment was actually depending. It will not be easy to imagine any third mode materially different which could rationally be proposed. As the court, for reasons already given, ought to be numerous, the first scheme will be reprobated by every man who can compare the extent of the public wants with the means of supplying them. The second will be espoused with caution by those who will seriously consider the difficulty of collecting men dispersed over the whole union, the injury to the innocent, from the, proca- from the procrastinated determination of the charges which might be brought against them, the advantage to the guilty from the opportunities which delay would afford to intrigue and corruption, and in some cases the detriment to the state from the prolonged inaction of men whose firm and faithful ex- execution of their duty might have exposed them to the prosecution, persecution of an intemperate or designing majority in the House of Representatives. Though this latter supposition may seem harsh and might not likely often and might not be likely often to be verified, yet it ought not to be forgotten that the demon of faction will, at certain seasons, extend his scepter over all numerous bodies of men. But though one or the other of the substitutes which have been examined, or some other that might be devised, should be thought preferable to the plan in this respect, reported by the convention, it will not follow that the Constitution ought for this reason to be rejected. If mankind were to resolve to agree in no institution of government until every part of it had been adjusted to the most exact standard of perfection, society would soon become a general scene of anarchy, and the world a desert. Where is the standard of perfection to be found? Who will undertake to unite the discordant opinions of a whole community in the same judgment of it? and to prevail upon one conceited projector to renounce his infallible criterion for the fallible criterion of his more conceited neighbor. To answer the purpose of the adversaries of the Constitution, they ought to prove not merely that particular provisions in it are not the best which might have been imagined, but that the plan upon the whole is bad and pernicious. Signed, Publius. All right, that concludes Federalist numbers 64 and 65. I think we're going to do Federalist number 66 by itself because it's kind of on the long side and it is kind of its own uh, topic here. So until then, this has been Mike signing off.